Over 900 years ago, the Tower of London was conceived with war in mind. It's the capital's most powerful stronghold. And when the country is in conflict, the tower becomes home to soldiers and spies, prisoners and executioners. This is the untold story of the Tower at War. The tower was built in the aftermath of the Battle of Hastings. Right from the start, it was a military base, serving in its time as an arsenal, barracks and prisoner of war camp. Although the tower has been open to tourists for hundreds of years, when the nation is in turmoil, the military have taken control. Even in the 20th century, each time Britain was at war, the tower reverted to its ancient role. Closed to visitors, it became a training ground and barracks for thousands of troops. Early in World War I, it became a place for military justice. In 1914, for the first time in more than a century, a prisoner was executed at the tower. His name was Carl Lodi. The incident was later recalled in this letter written by Major Archie Douglas, who at the time was the nine-year-old son of the tower barrack master. On the morning of Lodi's execution, I heard the movement of marching feet on the roadway. I saw one man, accompanied by a priest, who was obviously saying a prayer. There was a party of soldiers following the pair in front. My father said, you've just seen a man going to be shot. He said I was to tell nobody of what I'd seen. Soon afterwards, a party of men marched back down the road, away from the range. But who was the man that Archie saw? And why was he being secretly executed at the Tower of London? At the outbreak of war in 1914, Germany scoured its military for potential spies. Karl Lodi was a naval reservist who worked as a travel agent and so spoke passable English. German intelligence obtained an American passport in the name of Charles Inglis. As Lodi matched the description in the passport, he was called up. Lodi was a loyal German citizen and agreed to become a spy despite his lack of expertise. We knew about him all the time, from the time he came in to the country, he was spotted and they, they were just following him around and they knew exactly what he was up to. Lodi began his mission by spying on the British fleet in Edinburgh. He sent information he obtained by post to his espionage contact, Mr Burkhardt of Stockholm. All these letters were intercepted and they were known about and um, they never got anywhere. But he did send a telegram. Uh, again to Burkhart, which said uh, something like, um, Johnson ill, lost four days, shall return shortly. And for some reason, that telegram was allowed to go. Maybe the post office thought it was quite innocuous sounding thing, but it was in fact a coded message to say, several large warships are leaving port, you know, so do something about it. <laughs> On 30th of August 1914, HMS Pathfinder was the first ship sunk in World War I. 256 men died. So whilst Lowe didn't achieve much else, he, he at least um, was responsible for the sinking of the Pathfinder, which had been strenuously denied by almost all the Secret Service boffins at the time, who uh, said, you know, Lowe was useless, didn't do anything. 
Well, he did. He sank the Pathfinder. <laughs> on the 2nd of October, Lodi was arrested on instructions from Scotland Yard. Lodi claimed he was an innocent American citizen, the Charles Inglis described in his passport. But Lodi had made an extraordinary blunder. His overcoat contained not only a Berlin tailor's mark, but the name C.H. Lodi sewn inside. Accused of spying and charged with wartime treason, the trial lasted for three days and was recorded in this contemporary illustration. Lodi's only defence was that he was not a treacherous spy, but a soldier doing his duty. Although found guilty, the prosecuting court-martial and the government of the day were impressed by his patriotic defence. Quite a lot of high-powered people thought it was really bad to shoot Lodi, thought it, you know, because, because of his, his motives, purely patriotic motives, which is, you know, a good thing for everybody to have. As a spy found guilty of wartime treason by court-martial, Lodi's sentence was death by firing squad. The only nearby military base with an indoor rifle range suitable for the execution was the Tower of London. A yeoman warder described the execution. The calmest man on parade was the prisoner himself. Perfectly composed, he said to the assistant provost marshal, I suppose you will not shake hands with a spy. To which he replied, No, but I will shake hands with a very brave man. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Lodi was strapped into a Windsor chair with an aiming mark pinned to his chest. me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art... The Sergeant Major approached him in order to place a blindfold around his eyes, but the offer was courteously declined, and the Sergeant Major did not insist. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Firing party! Make ready! Present! The senior officer was clearly impressed by Lodi's conduct. When after the war, he wrote, he never flinched, he never cringed, but he died as one would wish all Englishmen to die. Quietly and undramatically, supported in his courage by the proud consciousness of having done his duty. Fire! Down! Unload! He wanted to face his adversaries. Um, in the way that a soldier or a serviceman would, uh, without being blindfolded. And clearly, his, in, in the words of the Provo Marshal, he neither flinched nor cringed. To so stand in front of a firing squad and with your eyes open, you know, there's no question about it. Very brave chap. The Admiralty, War Office and Press Committee issued this statement. The press are requested not to make any mention of the fact that the spy Lodi was shot this morning until further notice. But despite the government's best efforts to hush up the execution, rumours leaked out of the tower and objects associated with Lodi's execution became highly desirable. The chair was cut up into little pieces and sold for half a crown a time in the local pubs. The interesting thing about that is that um, they were out the same night selling the bits of chair when in fact the government had put a D-notice. Lodi's execution was not to be reported at all. Whilst nobody's supposed to know about it, here are the, here are the sort of soldiers from the, from the tower going out selling bits of chair that Lodi was sat in when he was shot. <laughs> a member of the firing squad also kept a memento which he later donated to the Guards Museum. Private Alfred Leeson claimed that he received a shilling on the day of the execution. We have no idea why he was given a shilling or by whom he was given the shilling. But it does rather reflect to the old days of executions, certainly of the great and the good at the Tower, when it was customary to reward the executioner with a gift of money. 
to ensure that he did a good job. Ten more spies were executed at the tower during World War I, and all were buried in Plasto Cemetery. But whilst the others were seen to deserve only a communal grave, Lodi was different. His patriotic motives and stalwart character had earned him the respect of both the British government and his jailers, and finally, a gravestone of his own. But while the court had sentenced Lodi as a spy, he wanted to be remembered as a soldier doing his duty. Lodi was determined to face the guns of his enemies blinded only by patriotism. On the night before his execution, he called for a bottle of champagne and wrote this letter to his family. My dear ones, I have trusted in God and he has decided. My hour has come and I must start on the journey through the dark valley like so many of my comrades in this terrible war of nations. May my life be honoured as a humble offering on the altar of the fatherland. A hero's death on the battlefield is certainly finer, but such is not to be my lot, and I die in the enemy's country, silent and unknown. But the consciousness that I die in the service of the fatherland makes death easy. I have had just judges, and I shall be shot as an officer, not as a spy. Farewell, God bless you. Fire! Eleven spies were shot at the tower between 1914 and 1916, making World War I the bloodiest period in the tower's history. The only other time the state executed so many for treachery was almost 300 years earlier during the English Civil War. England, 1642. The turbulent relationship between King Charles I and Parliament has reached an all-time low. The country has descended into civil war. Who's for the, king? Who's the, king? the king has fled to Oxford to raise an army. For the first time, Parliament has a chance to take control of the Tower of London. Three hundred and fifty years later, the Civil War is still commemorated at the Tower. We're about to see a demonstration of live firing of 17th century matchlock muskets. At the time of the Civil War, the Tower of London was the traditional arsenal of the nation. For 500 years, English troops had been equipped with weapons stockpiled at the Tower. In 1642, Pressure from Parliament forced the Royalist commander of the Tower to desert his post. Parliament took control of the Tower without a fight, and then turned the King's arsenal against him on the battlefield. As the war progressed, the Tower became more than simply an arsenal. Whilst doing battle with the King's forces, the Parliamentarians captured hundreds of Royalist prisoners. The Tower of London became a prisoner of war camp. Tower prison records show 80 high-ranking royalists were held at the Tower during the Civil War, nine of whom were executed. But the records from this chaotic period are murky. New evidence has emerged that a tenth royalist prisoner was beheaded here after a failed attempt to murder Oliver Cromwell. Canadian Ken Isaac believes his ancestor was the tenth man. Sir Walter was an ancestor of mine that was possibly held in this tower during the Civil War and eventually beheaded for attempting to assassinate Oliver Cromwell. Wow. So this is it. This is the room that my ancestor, Sir Walter, may have been held in. See, there's graffiti all over the walls. People have carved their names in here. Well, it's a little spooky. You know, to think that uh, this has served as so many uh, people's jail cell. Well, I've looked around. I don't see any of uh, Sir Walter's graffiti, but I do have this letter. 
and uh, I think he was held here. The letter is dated May 1644, Tower of London. My dear Frank, you will doubtless be astonished to see by the subscription of this that I am caught at last. When you set out for France, I intended to shortly afterwards follow you, but some evil demon put it into my head to make an attempt to assassinate Cromwell. I need not say that the attempt failed. I was immediately seized and condemned to die upon the scaffold without the formality of a trial. The only mercy that was granted me was that I might be beheaded, not hung. I will meet death as a man ought. The only thing that pains me is the destitute situation my wife and I in. The jailers tell me I must conclude. Give my love to all. I remain your friend, Walter Isaac. And it's a postscription. P.S. Tell Lord Wilmot that I cannot conclude the match with him at cricket as I promised. I do, Frank, for the last time. There were certainly royalist officers held at the tower during the Civil War. But in the upheaval that engulfed the country, many official records went missing or were destroyed. Perhaps the documents which recorded Walter Isaac's life and death were amongst them. Ken first heard about his ancestor five years ago when he received a copy of the letter by email. Since then, he's been trying to trace the originals so that Walter Isaac can take his rightful place in the history books. Today, his search has come to an end at the home of a distant relative, John Isaac. Okay, Ken, well, these are the old papers. You don't want to touch them, you know, you want to put gloves on or something, because they, they do indeed look very old. Well, it certainly gives one a bit of a kick when you look at these old letters, which have obviously been written by members of the family. <laughs> That's okay. He sounds as though he was quite a, quite a lad, shall we say. Obviously a bit impetuous, or he wouldn't have tried to knock off Cromwell. The letter Ken has seen is just part of John's collection. The Isaac family is to Walter's wife and child, Lady Mary. An unsigned Lady Marion gives a detail of Sir Walter's final days. According to your wish, I write you a full account of your late husband's death. After the unlucky Battle of Worcester, Sir Walter fled from the field. I heard no more about him until a few days ago, when I heard Sir Walter had been apprehended for attempting to rid the country of Cromwell, and that he was confined to the tower and was to be executed. The sentence was put in force on Tower Hill. Sir Walter rose up and said, I'm going to be executed this day for attempting to rid the earth of a monster. You have come to see how a man and a Catholic can die. You will not be disappointed. With a single stroke, his head was severed from his body. The executioner then waved it aloft, saying, The head of a traitor. Well, as you read these letters of a condemned man, it's like reading them. Read the more you get to know the character. He sounds like a really neat guy. He lived in a castle. And I think everybody would like to think that their ancestors lived in a castle. With the discovery that Sir Walter Isaac fought at the Battle of Worcester, Ken has the chance to step into his ancestors' shoes by taking part in a modern-day reenactment. Welcome to the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Battle of Worcester that was uh, the last big battle that uh, Sir Walter participated in before he got caught. Well, I want to find out what it was like to be out there, ready to rumble. The Battle of Worcester was the final battle of the Civil War. Charles II raised an army of Scots and was determined to regain control of London and the Tower, but he was intercepted in Worcester by Oliver Cromwell's forces. The parliamentary control of the Tower
had no choice. Royalists were killed and six taken prisoner. The civil war was over. The most puzzling fact about the battle when it happened. If Walter Isaac fought at the Battle of Worcester in 1651, why is the letter from the tower dated 1644, seven years too early? Confused by this revelation, Ken has decided to take the original letters to the Tower of London, where he's heard they keep a list of known prisoners. You've heard something of our letters? Yeah, I'm very excited about seeing them. Well, here they are. Wow. With great trouble, Anybody? we've brought these to you. Oh, look at them. Gosh, these are wonderful things to have. Anna Kay is the curator of the Tower, who specializes in the Civil War era. This is a chronological record of all the people who were imprisoned at the tower. If we go from 1642, mm -hmm. we've got Gardner, Gurney, Herbert, Hopton. So that's 1645. Jenkins, Park, Paulet, Peak. So that takes us up to 47. Penn Ruddock, Renardson, Walker, Andrews. So these are the people taken prisoner after the Battle of Worcester. Leslie, Leslie, Leslie. There's no mention of him there. The Book of Prisoners is not an exhaustive list of those held at the tower and is revised whenever new evidence comes to light. In order to prove that Walter Isaac deserves an entry in the book, Ken must have the letters independently verified. One phrase in particular has been worrying him. P.S. Tell Lord Wilmont that I cannot conclude the match with him at cricket as I promised. But did cricket exist as early as 1644? If not, then the letters from the tower must be fakes. Ken has decided to ask Stephen Green, the curator of the Cricket Museum at Lord's. Well, what do you know about cricket, Ken? Uh, well, I know very little. Just what I've seen on television, it seems to be there's a, uh, uh, and I don't even know if I have the positions right, but a pitcher that uh, tries to knock down uh, a series of uh, posts and a batter that tries to interfere with that pitch. I think the terminology might not be approved of by the purists, but I think you've got the basic I'll idea. Have the basics down, okay. <laughs> As a Canadian, I haven't seen it much, although this letter, we believe, was written by a, an ancestor of mine that was beheaded at the Tower of London. It says, Tell Lord Wilmot that I cannot conclude the match with him at cricket, as I promised. Adieu, Frank, for the last time. Um, and we thought that this might be a very early reference to cricket. Well, it's certainly very early. Um, it's not by any means the earliest, but it's among the earliest. I did a little list some time ago. Um, four, that's 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. I make it about the 24th or 25th earliest reference that I know of uh, to cricket. We don't know when cricket started, but the earliest reference that we know absolutely for certain is dated 1598 and that refers to an incident 50 years previously, so you can get back for certain till about 1550. But for all we know, it may be a much, much older game. With confirmation that cricket was being played well before 1644, it is still possible that the letters were written in the 17th century and that Walter Isaac did indeed exist. But the dates of the battle still don't add up. If Ken's going to rewrite English history, he needs verification from the highest authority. Dr. Peter Beale is one of Britain's leading experts in document authentication. He's seen hundreds of letters from the 16th and 17th centuries. That paper doesn't look to be 17th century. 17th century paper is very good paper. Mm -hmm. It's linen paper. It's made with uh, cloth. All these in a very, very thin nib, which I suspect is a metal pen. Mm -hmm. You don't quite get that regularity with quills. And uh, metal steel tip pens didn't come in until the end of the 18th century. Oh, I see. The handwriting does not look like the handwriting of somebody writing in 1644. It's very bold, it's very clear, it's very rounded. Everything about it is, is modern. But these themselves are not original, authentic letters. I'm quite sure of that. Handwriting underwent a change in the 18th century. It evolved from secretary script, which is almost illegible today, into recognisable modern handwriting. So the Isaac papers could not have been written before 1700. In fact, as they've been written with a pen, not a quill, 
they must have been written well after the Civil War. The question is, are the letters copies of Sir Walter's originals or the work of a forger? The answer lies in the authenticity of the text. See by the superscription of this that I am caught at last. Some evil demon put it into my head to make an attempt to assassinate Cromwell. I can't believe anybody would write that. It brings back memories of the Hitler diaries, you know. I think that, that uh, Hess chap, I'm going to have to get rid of him or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's just not sort of, it's too obvious, you know. I will meet death as a man or sounds like Captain Scott. And the jailers tell me that I must conclude. Give my love to all. No, that's everything about that. It's like something out of a 19th century melodrama. I'm caught at last. Fate has ordained that blah blah. So much for the tender mercies of the usurper. You know, you can almost imagine somebody declaiming that on the Victorian stage. So much for. I think these are fabrications. Um, maybe done for a bit of fun. Who knows? The language of the letters suggests that they were written in the 19th century, perhaps by someone with more talent for storytelling than for serious forgery. But does that mean the Isaac family are simply fictional characters? Are Walter, Marion and George really just figments of someone's imagination? The date. No, can't see any date there. Perhaps not. There is one letter in the Isaac papers which until now has been illegible. But Dr. Beale seems to think it's a genuine legal document and may prove that at least one member of the family did exist. Is it Camardin? It's a legal document to do with property and so on. All I can say is it looks like perfectly good, authentic 17th century script done by a professional scribe and it's secretary script, which is precisely what we don't find anywhere else in any of these. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's a forgery, it's an extremely good one. It's somebody who really knows his 17th century script. The one authentic document amongst the Isaac papers bears the name George Isaac, the same name as Walter's supposed son. So a George Isaac did exist, but was he the son of one of the royalist officers beheaded at the Tower of London? Hello. Nice Hello, to Ken. see you again. Good to see you again. How are you today? Very well. Great. I've got some more papers which you might like to see, ah. some old papers. Ken's met up with John Isaac in order to return the letters and tell him the bad news. But while Ken's been away, John has made an exciting discovery amongst parish records. Here you've got Marion Isaac, uh, Sir Walter's wife. Yes. Marrying Thomas Marriott in 1657. Ah, so she remarried. So it, it looks as though she remarried, obviously, an Englishman. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. So we know that uh, a Mary and Isaac did exist. Have you seen anything of her son, George? Well, I suspect this is her son, George Isaac, here. So whoever forged the Isaac papers based the characters on at least two genuine people. This suggests the author had an intimate knowledge of the Isaac family. So perhaps he or she was a descendant, relating real events based on a story kept alive by the family, but lost to history during the turmoil of the Civil War. While at least 80 royalist captives were held at the tower during this time, until more evidence emerges, it is impossible to say if Sir Walter Isaac was amongst them. The only Certainty is that the use of the tower as a prisoner of war camp ended along with the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. But the tradition was revived within living memory when German prisoners were held here during World War II. Arriving at a Scottish port, a British destroyer brings in more U-boat prisoners. I wonder how they feel, these youthful German sailors, as they gaze at Britain from a British warship. Ich kann mich noch mal, wie wir dann in den Tower kamen. Das Gefühl, wir kommen in, das, in den berühmten Tower. The Tower of London began preparing for World War II before it had even officially begun. On the 26th of August 1939, the tower was closed to the public and evacuation of the collection began the same day. The crown jewels were removed for the duration of the war. Exactly where they were stored remains a secret to this day. 
Less than a week afterwards, Germany invaded Poland, and two days later, on the 3rd of September 1939, Britain declared war. On that very day, the Tower Prisoner of War Collection Centre was opened. For the first time in almost 300 years, the Tower once again was a POW camp. Amongst the prisoners were the entire crew of German U-boat U-35. When they were brought to the tower, these German seamen were already world famous. In October 1939, they had committed an act of honor and daring, which had put them on the front cover of America's Life magazine. U-35 was 50 miles off Land's End when she torpedoed the SS Diamantes, a Greek vessel bringing coal to Britain. But rather than let the Greeks go down with a ship, the German crew rescued the enemy sailors. 23-year-old Willy Jakob helped the Greeks on board. With RAF planes closing in, the German sailors had risked their lives to save their enemies. Over the next two days, U-35 played a desperate game of cat and mouse with British forces. They crept around England to Neutral Island and landed the Greek sailors at Dingle Bay before making their escape. We had so a small dinghy, so a small boat. Yeah, yeah. Unser, uh, Walter Kallerbuch from our boat. Five men Greek in the no, Or four, I don't know anymore. I think five. And then he had to go around on the coast. This daring act fascinated the world's press. An American cigarette card even commemorated the moment when the Greek sailors were released in Ireland. Just two months later, it was a German U-boat men who were hoping for mercy. By the winter of 1939, German submarines were seriously disrupting British supply lines. Lord Mountbatten led a fleet of destroyers charged with countering the U-boat menace. On November the 27th, Mountbatten's fleet was hunting U-boats in the North Sea when they detected the famous U-35. Amongst the crew of the doomed submarine was 24-year-old Kurt Grosser. Wir haben ja morgens um 9 Uhr fing der Kampf an. Da kamen die ersten Wasserbomben. Und da haben wir auch immer noch ausweichen können, ja. Aber ich meine klar, dass wir da schon dran gedacht haben, jetzt ist jetzt das Ende, oder das kann jetzt das Ende gehen. Das, das kann keiner abschreiten, dass, dass, dass dann ihr Gefühl kommt, jetzt, jetzt bist du dran. Ne? Trapped underwater in a damaged submarine, Commander Werner Lott had little choice if he was to save the lives of his crew. Unser Kommandant sagte, auftauchen, retten sich, wer sie retten kann. Und dann waren wir alle an Oberdeck. Das Boot ging auf Tiefe. Dann riefen wir nochmal U-35, hurra, hurra, hurra. Und dann kamen die, die drei Zerstörer, die uns eingekreist hatten, die fischten aus dem Wasser. Just as the crew of U-35 had saved their enemies two months earlier, they now found themselves rescued by the British. This photograph captured the moment when the Germans were picked up. The Severe magazine even commissioned a sketch to mark the submarine crew's amazing reversal of fortune. The Matrosen, they were einmalig. They had first the Klamotten vom Leib gerissen, die Nassen, haben uns aus ihrer, aus ihrer Buchse Sachen gegeben, Hosen, Pullover, anziehen, dass wir wieder warm wurden, ja? Ja, die waren die Seeleute, prima Kumpel, die kamen gleich mit Tee da an und Zerretten und allem drum und dran, ne? Oh, alles okay, junger Boy, ja? alles okay, ne? willst du trinken, Zerrette? Ja? Handshakes are exchanged as the Germans come ashore, they may be enemies, but the tradition of the sea is one of courtesy between victor and vanquished, and Britain knows how to treat her prisoners. The British sailors treated them so well that Commander Lott even wrote in the visitor's book of HMS Kingston. Wishing you good luck except against German U-boats. But the gentlemanly conduct of the British could not extend to the freeing of prisoners. Instead, the crew of U-35 were taken to the new National Prisoner of War Collection Centre at the Tower of London. 62 years after they were first brought here as prisoners of war, 
Kurt Grosser and Willy Jacob have returned to the Tower of London. They are two of the last remaining people alive who remember the tower as a prison. Aber jedenfalls, für mich ist es überwältigend, das noch mal zu sehen. Vor 62 Jahren hier gewesen und jetzt darf ich das noch mal sehen. Das ist schön. The last time the two men were here, the tower was a working military base, a barracks for soldiers and a POW camp. In 1939, photography was banned and tourists were not admitted. Since then, the building where Willy was once held a prisoner has been replaced by the cages of the Tower Ravens. Here is the Gebäude wahrscheinlich gewesen, wo ich drin war. Wie ich schon mal gesagt habe, konnten wir dann links die Towerbrücke sehen. Wenn man so eingesperrt ist, kriegt man ja manchen blöden Gedanken. Und ein Kamerad war dabei, der hatte einen schönen Gedanken. Der machte das Gedicht. Wir wollen wieder nach Deutschland, denn hier ist der Arsch der Welt. Und heute gehört uns Deutschland und morgen die ganze Welt. U-35 Commander Werner Lott was held in the same building as Willy, but was so appalled by the conditions that he went on hunger strike and demanded to see an officer. Two days later, he was visited by Lord Mountbatten himself. By way of apology, Mountbatten took Lot out for dinner at Scott's restaurant, on condition that he promised not to escape. For a single evening, the two men were not enemies at war, but fellow seamen having dinner. Lot kept his promise not to escape, and he returned to the tower, where Kurt and Willie were still eating tower food. We said, today, coal from the left, and tomorrow, coal from the right. Speck. The brown speck, that was good. Aber mittags, da war, da war schon wieder nichts mehr drin. Da gab es meistens Pellkartoffeln und so, so ein bisschen was dazu. Aber das war Essen. Von Essen kann man da nicht mehr reden. Ab. Englisches Essen in England, den Ausdruck will ich nicht gebrauchen. But despite the conditions, there is one fond memory that has kept Willie amused over the years. Da wurden wir morgens und abends gezählt. Und äh, der, der Major oder wer das war, Der stand dann auf so einem Protest und auf dem Protest war vorne, ich sag, bei uns zu Hause sagt man so eine Teppichstange darüber, so wie er, so eine Stange. Und dann stand der Major da und beobachtete die englischen Soldaten, wie die uns zählten. Und auf einmal kam so eine Rabe da angeflogen, setzte sich auf die Teppichstange und schiss dem Major genau auf die Mütze. Was haben wir gelacht? Also, tausend Mann haben gelacht wie noch nie. Und der Major nahm seine Mütze ab, guckte, shit, fand, äh, jetzt wieder auf und Schluss war. William and Kurt were held in different buildings within the tower. The new armories is now a cafeteria and corporate hospitality center. But back in 1939, this place had a purpose that has haunted Kurt ever since. Das ist die, die, die Straße, kann man sehen, und dann, wenn man so schräg guckt, konnte man die Brücke sehen. Und das ist hier gewesen. Das muss der Raum gewesen sein, wo wir gefangen gehalten wurden. Das kann gar nicht anders gewesen sein. Denn der Blick hier runter, der ist mir noch so in Erinnerung. Das habe ich, da bin ich ganz sicher. Fühlt es sich jetzt gut? Oder ja, ich fühle mich recht, <lacht> ich fühle mich, wie gesagt, wie erlöst, dass ich das gefunden habe. Noch mal da zu sein, wo wir wirklich waren. Also das ist schon ein, ein ganz besonderes Gefühl. Also das, wenn man so 62 Jahre zurückdenkt und wir hier in so einem kahlen Raum waren und heute so mit Teppichboden und hier reinkommen und trotzdem ist es derselbe Raum. Es ist enorm. Also das Gefühl ist enorm. Das kann man gar nicht beschreiben. Das kann mir gar keiner, also wenn gar keiner reingucken, wie ich mich fühle. Das eingesperrt sein hier drin in den Raum und nur zum Essen mal holen und, und, und immer, wieder, immer, wieder hier drin, immer wieder hier drin und noch nicht mal auf der Britsche liegen können, da sie war. Das war das Schlimme. Wenn man hätte ein bisschen schlafen können, da wäre immer noch Gedanken voll. Also das war ja das. Ach, Gott sei Dank. Haben Sie verstanden? Wenn man abgeschieden ist, getrennt ist von Angehörigen, Ja, die Erinnerung, wir waren noch zu Hause. 
Tem um nada arremata. From the tower, the crew of U-35 were transferred to northern England and ultimately to Canada. Kurt and Willy eventually made it back to Germany in 1946 and have remained friends ever since. The tower prisoner of war camp closed very soon afterwards in December 1939 due to overcrowding. Only prisoners of the very highest rank would now be kept at the tower. In 1940, the Battle of Britain began in earnest. For the first time in its history, the tower had to face the onslaught of the Blitz. Easter ended and London again suffered the fury of Hitler's bombers. Another wild, indiscriminate orgy of destruction. For seemingly endless hours, the horrible scream of bombs and roar of flames went on. The blood, the sweat and tears that Nazi warfare feeds on. The North Bastion was destroyed by a direct hit on the 5th of October 1940. It was the worst damage the tower had seen in over 500 years. A yeoman warder and the tower electrician's mother both lost their lives. But perhaps the most dramatic attack on the tower was the burning of the main guard in December 1940. Over 50 incendiaries were dropped on the building where only a year before, German prisoners had been held captive. Whilst bombs rained down on London, only one man was imprisoned at the tower, the highest profile German to be captured on British soil. Once again, the hungry fires released by German raiders roared through the streets of London. But 33 bombers were shot out of the skies on that night when Rudolf Hess parachuted himself into Britain. Hitler's shadow and champion of the double cross. Rudolf Hess was a, was a friend of Adolf Hitler, and with Adolf Hitler's rise to power, so Ad, uh, Rudolf Hess rose with him, to the extent that he became, at the start of the Second World War, Deputy Chancellor of Nazi Germany. For whatever reason, in May 1941, he left Germany on an aeroplane heading for Scotland. He maintains, I, I think I'm right in saying that he maintains it was actually sued for peace. Hess piloted the plane from Germany himself. It crash-landed in Scotland where the wreckage was recovered. Hess injured himself on landing and was discovered by a local farmer who expressed the surprise of a nation. Yes, I am the man who captured Rudolf Hess. Little did I realise at the time the important man he turned out to be. He said he had come from Germany. He appeared to be a man of a gentleman of good education, and I introduced him to my mother. This is my mother, of whom I am very proud, and who looked after the German prisoner. It was a pleasure yeah. to do anything for this gentleman, although he was a Jerry. He was a gentleman. But he didn't sit down when I took him in, till I told him. And after all, he was somebody's son. Hess had flown to Scotland, is understood, to talk to um, a member of the House of Lords who he thought um, had certain, um, I won't say tendencies towards Germany, but certainly he thought he would have got a fair hearing from him. But of course, he was discovered, arrested, um, he was up there for a couple of days before being brought to London. Hess was a complete surprise and too high a risk to be interned with other prisoners of war. The tower, as secure as any jail, was the only place thought suitable for such an important prisoner. Rudolf Hess, whilst he was in the Tower of London a prisoner, was actually lodged in what is now the Queen's House, in them days known as the King's House. He exercised walking around what we now know as Tower Green. He did that quite happily. Um, he wasn't escorted, from what we understand, because he couldn't go anywhere. I mean, the whole place was a fortress. Those same walls keep the King's enemies out, keep the King's enemies in. As a result, he could quite happily walk around Tower Green um, for his exercise. Um, somebody even asked him for his autograph. He, he apparently agreed to this autograph um, happily, but when handed a piece of paper, turned it over and said, oh, the Tower of London, so that's where I am. The signature still hangs on the wall of the Yeoman Warders Club. Although Hess only stayed at the Tower for four days before being transferred to a stately home for the duration of the war. 
The only other trace of his imprisonment lies in the tower's storeroom. Well, the Tower of London is full of all sorts of uh, tales and imaginative suggestions. One of those tales is connected with this wooden head, which some members of the staff have suggested to me based on Rudolf Hess, the deputy rights Führer, who was imprisoned at the Tower of London or held here for four days during May. It could be Vinnie, couldn't it? Vinnie James. But there you are, it's anyone's guess, isn't it? Keeper of Tower history, Geoffrey Parnell. The storeroom that holds items in the collection. Objects which are not on general display. Um. Well, the history of, a of the Tower of London as a state prison really ends with this object. This chair was used uh, during the execution of a man called uh, Josef Jacobs. He was uh, a man from Luxembourg who was in the pay of the German Secret Service and he was dropped into England on the 1st of February 1941 as a spy and he was caught absolutely from the word go. I mean, he was rounded up by some locals and handed over to the authorities. The Secret Service had finished with him and failed to turn him into a double spy. He wouldn't work for the British. Um, he was duly brought to the Tower of London and as I say, on the 15th of August 1941, he was executed here. And this is obviously where the bullets pass through Mr. Jacobs uh, smashing up the rail and removing two of the spokes. We put this on display for the first time a few years back uh, amid some misgivings from the Tower authorities who were uh, always keen to see a portrayal of people being killed in the century, but we were very apprehensive about um, executions in the 20th century. But that's, if it happened in the 17th century, it's all fun. But when it happens in the 20th century, and it's much more clinical, it just involves a firing squad, they don't want to know. We in the Tower of London are quite sensitive um, towards person, personal feelings of our visitors. Uh, yes, we talk about the historical context of the executions of Sam and Sudbury in the 14th century, um, and Berlin in the 16th century. Tell that without a problem. People want to hear that. is certainly regarded to is, is, is discuss um, executions that happened in the 20th century. I suppose it's, it's too close to home and inevitably you could actually be discussing on a guided tour somebody's great-grandfather or grandfather or even, we're not too far away, somebody's father. So the history of wartime executions at the Tower of London ends far later than the gruesome beheadings of the Middle Ages, enthusiastically recounted in the Yeoman Warders' tours. And he would bring that axe crushing down. It ends just over 60 years ago, with Josef Jacobs charged with treachery and shot by firing squad. Before the World Wars, no one thought tourists would be replaced by prisoners. In the uncertain world of the 21st century, perhaps the history of the Tower at War has not ended yet.